You may have noticed that during the meditation, when I was telling you to watch the breath and also watch your mind watching the breath. And have you ever wondered why it is in Buddhist meditation they keep telling you to watch your mind in the present moment? <clears throat> I have a student whose parents are Hindu, and they kept saying, why are you watching your mind? Why aren't you meditating on God? <laughs> and the reason why the Buddha has you focus on the present moment is because of the way he teaches karma. In fact, with any Buddhist teaching, it's always good to relate it to how does the Buddha understand their actions, because that's what karma is, your actions. How does he understand the principle of action and how it gives results in your life? And this is very relevant to how he, why he has you focus on the mind. Because the mind in the present moment is creating a lot of karma, it's doing a lot of actions. When the Buddha classified himself as a teacher, he would use the word gamma wadin, which means basically someone who teaches karma or someone who teaches action. And that was to distinguish him from all the teachers of his time who said that human action doesn't exist or that it doesn't have any impact. We tend to think that everybody in India believed in karma and rebirth, but that was not the case. A lot of people didn't. So the Buddha was pointing out he, he taught karma and he taught rebirth. But then he had to distinguish himself from other people who taught karma as well. There was a group called the Nikantas, who also taught karma, but their teaching about the present moment was that your present moment is totally influenced by the past. What you've done in the past shapes your present. What you're going to do now is going to shape the future, but you can't change your present moment. That was their attitude. And their belief was that you, all karma was going to create suffering, so you basically try to be very still and not do anything and put up with the pain that would come with austerities, to say that you're burning off your old karma, and that when you had finally burned off all your old karma, then you'd be released. And if you think that the Buddha was someone who would speak nothing but sweetness and light, you'd probably be surprised at some of the comments he made to these Nignagantas. He asked them one day, how much karma have you burned off today? Can you measure this? No. And he says, have you ever noticed that um, when you're doing your austerities, there's pain? But when you stop doing your austerities, there's no pain? <laughs> In other words, he's saying it's not just your past karma that's giving you the pain right now, it's what you're doing right now. And so for him it's a very important principle that the present moment is not totally ready-built from the past, that you're actually constructing it as you go along in the present moment. You're putting it together from raw materials that come from your past karma, but then it's how you put it together right now is what's going to make the difference between whether you're suffering or not. And so this is one of the reasons why we focus on the mind in the present moment, because the mind is doing this act of constructing the present moment all the time. And you want to see that in action. Because if you're not careful about how you do it, you're going to suffer. If you're careful about how you do it and skillful, you don't have to suffer. The Buddha gave an example. He said, suppose you have some bad karma from the past. Think of it as being like a large lump of salt. And if your state of mind in the present moment is narrow and untrained, it's like a little cup of water. You put the lump of salt into the water, you can't drink it because it's too salty. But if the mind has been trained, it's like a large river. And I guess he's thinking about large, unpolluted rivers. And <laughs> you put the lump of salt in the river, and you can still drink the water because there's just so much more water than there is salt. He said, it's your present moment state of mind that's going to determine whether you're going to suffer from past bad karma or not. So it's your present karma that makes all the difference. So this is why we focus on the present moment. As the Buddha said, there's work to be done here, learning how to be more skillful about how to shape the present moment. There was a, a poem that he said that he recited one time. He says, you know, you you put aside thoughts of the past, you put aside thoughts of the future, you focus right on what's happening right now, right now. He said, the, the reason you do that is because death may come tomorrow. You don't know when you're going to die, but you do know you have this present moment to do the work that needs to be done. So he's focusing on the fact that because we're constructing the present moment through our decisions as we go through the, as we go through the, day, the day, we really want to pay careful attention here. Because if you don't do this well now, the state of your mind can lead you into all kinds of bad directions. When you, when you die, you have no idea where it's going to take you. 
if it's trained, you do have an idea of where it's going to take you because you have some control over it. So this is why we focus in the present moment. And the teaching on karma also tells us what we're going to find as we, as we look there, what we can do with it, and also why the present moment is not the goal. So it's good to keep this in mind. I don't know how many times people say, you Buddhists, you believe all it's all about just getting into the present moment, you're going to hang out there. Well, my dog is in the present moment all the time. <laughs> and, yeah, but no, the present moment is not the goal, it's the means. It can be made in, into a path to true happiness. It can be made to the path into suffering. As so that poem said, you ardently do your duty today because you don't know if death may come tomorrow. And there are other duties the Buddha. The Buddha doesn't impose duties on you, but he basically says, given the Four Noble Truths, what, you, what he was going to teach you about suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation. Is that somebody's ringtone? <laughs> the cessation and then the path to cessation of suffering. Each of these has a duty. As, again, he doesn't impose it on you, but he says, look, if you want to put it into suffering, this is what you've got to do. You've got to comprehend why you're suffering what the suffering is, basically. You have to abandon the cause, and then you realize the cessation by developing the path. So these are things that you're going to be doing in the present moment. But what have you got in the present moment? We tend to think that the present moment starts with sensory contact. You know, a sight comes, hits the eye, a sound hits the ear, and that's the present moment. But in the Buddha's analysis of the present moment, in teaching it's called dependent core arising, Sensory contact comes only halfway through. There are lots of things that are happening before you have a contact at the senses. The mind is actually out looking for things. It starts with ignorance, and then there's the big, probably the most influential of the factors is something called fabrication. The Pali word is sankara. It's how you're putting things together. It's also your intentions, what you're looking for. We tend to look for things that we can feed on. We tend to look for things that we're going to get out of the sensory contact. And then based on that, we have certain perceptions, certain things that we will pay attention to or not pay attention to. All this is coming prior to sensory contact. So we're not simply on the receiving end of things. If we were simply on the receiving end of things, there would be no Amazon. <laughs> you know, your computer doesn't turn itself on yet. You, know, you have to you know, tell her or turn it on yourself. It's because we're out looking for things. You know, there's a short story that I translated from Thai a little while back. This guy is given a talisman, and he's told that he can ask for anything he likes, would want. And so all of a sudden he's overcome with the idea of all the things that he could ask for that he never thought of wanting before. We're always looking for new things to want. What, what do I want? I don't know what I want. Let's look, on, let's look online. This is also why we have hate radio. You want to be angry. Turn on some hate radio. You get angry either at the what they're talking about or angry at the person talking. <laughs> but that's—I mean—we're out there looking for trouble, basically. <laughs> and this is the process that comes prior to sensory contact. And it's good that we take responsibility for this, because otherwise we're just going to think, "Well, I'm suffering because of things outside coming in." But the Buddha says it's the way you're fabricating and making your intentions and creating your perceptions and acts of attention, that's going to determine whether you're going to suffer or not from the sensory contact. And so if you're unskillful, even nice things can make you suffer. If you're, if you're unskillful. If you're skillful, even bad things will not make you suffer. So this, this is why it's so important to look into the mind, to look at this process. Now this process of fabrication, the Buddha says, um, fabricates what are called aggregates which are basically activities of your body and activities in your mind. We're creating these things out of raw material. He says, we're always doing it for a purpose. We want these things because we can use them. We use our perceptions, we use our thoughts, and so we keep creating them for a particular purpose. So when we're sitting in the present moment, this present moment is not just an end in and of itself. And also, you're not stepping out of time. Some people say, say when you're in the present moment, you're stepping out of time. Actually, you're creating the conditions for the present moment and the future in the present. So you're actually creating the ongoing experience of time while you're here in the present moment. So you want to look at that. How are you doing it? How skillful are you about this process of how, what you want out of your experience? 
And so basically this is, a, the Buddha said, this is what you're going to find, that the present moment is a construction site. It's constantly being constructed. And you look at it, you probably had that, that sort of uncanny vertigo experience when you realize, okay, this present moment is gone. This present moment, gone, gone. As soon as it comes, it's gone. You can't call it back. So it's disintegrating. At the same time, because we're not doing it skillfully, there's going to be suffering. This is why he says it's on fire. You're trying to create a house in the present moment and it keeps falling apart because it's burning, burning. And so basically he's saying well, there are ways that you can build relatively good houses and at the same time learn about this process, how you're creating these little houses for yourself so eventually you can get out. So that's why we're in the present moment. So what do you do? You also, because the mind is proactive, the path itself is also proactive. proactive. In other words, you're going to be fabricating a path using those same aggregates you're going to have. It's basically a form, form of the body, feeling, which are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions, these are the labels you put on things. Fabrications, which are your thought constructs and intentions. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of these things. Now we tend to, as the Buddha said, identify ourselves around these things. You know, the kind of the feelings we like, the perceptions we like. If you look in, in personal ads, it's people defining themselves in terms of aggregates. You know, I want a person of this, this orientation or this particular type for you know, nice walks in the afternoon and sitting by a fire and that kind of thing. The kind of pleasures we feed on. We identify ourselves around this. This is, this is basically who, is who I am. And one of the reasons why the Buddha talks about these particular five things, the form, feeling, perception, fabrication, and consciousness, is that we employ these activities in our feeding, both physical feeding and emotional feeding. Now take physical food. Okay, you've got the form of the body. This is your physical form, which needs to be maintained. And you've got the form of food out there, which you're going to be taking in. Feeling, you've got the feeling of hunger, which you want to put it into, and then the feeling of fullness, which you're trying to create. Your perceptions are basically, how do I identify, what kind of hunger do I have? Is this a hunger for ice cream? Is this hunger for a relationship? Is this hunger for whatever? And then what out there is going to satisfy that hunger? Now, as little kids, this is how we go through the world. You know, you see a little kid walking, you know, crawling across the floor, this, they find something, what do they do? Stick it in the mouth. Is this edible? And that's how we basically classify the world. There are edible things and unedible things. <laughs> and so that's perception. And then there's fabrication, which is, say you get a raw potato. You, you, first you say, how am I going to find the food I want? Then sometimes you get the food you want, but it's not edible as it is, but you can't fix it. Like you get a raw potato. What do you do with a raw potato? You can bake it, you can fry it, you can do all kinds of things. That's fabrication. The mind's thinking about things, how it's going to get what it wants. That's out there. And then finally, consciousness is aware of all these things. So you've got those five activities in the process of feeding, because feeding is probably our most basic process, or our most basic function. That's why we identify ourselves so solidly around these things. Now, as the Buddha points out, we, if we hold on to these things, we're going to suffer. This is probably the part of his teaching that goes most against the grain, because these are our strategies for happiness, for finding what we want, and the Buddha said, you're suffering because of them. But he also says you can learn how to do them in a skillful way so you can get in a relatively comfortable place to stay in the present moment. That is good, not only for because it's a good place to stay, but also it's going to give you insight into what's going on in the mind, so you can take, start taking it apart. Because think about the concentration practice we're doing just now. It's got, it had all those five aggregates. You've got the form of the body, i.e. the breath. You've got the feeling of pleasure that you'll be able to create out of the breath. You have the perception, your perception of what the breath is and how it functions in the body. And you can play with different perceptions. If you perceive the body as a bellows and you're just squeezing the air in, squeezing air out, it's not going to be a very comfortable perception. If you think of the body as being like a big sponge and as you breathe in, the air is coming in and out through all the pores, that creates a much more comfortable a sensation of breathing. 
Or if you think of the breath energy not as something you have to pull from outside, but as something originating from within the body, you find that it's even more easeful. So you can work with the perception and it will have an impact on what you're experiencing. Then this fabrication, as you're talking to yourself about, is this breath comfortable? Is that not? Is that breath comfortable? If it's not comfortable, what do I do to make it better? And finally, you've got consciousness, which is aware of all these things. So you're taking these five processes and you're actually turning them into part of the path. This is what right resolve, which is the resolve to find a way of finding happiness that's not going to harm anybody. Right mindfulness, which is the process of focusing, say, on the breath in and of itself and putting aside your interest in everything else. And then the right conscious concentration that develops as a result. So this is how you're creating a path in the present moment. Now you notice, this is pre proactive as well. If you're going to learn about the proactive processes going on in the mind, you have to take a proactive approach. It's like being a CEO of a, of a corporation. The best CEOs are the ones who know all the jobs that everybody has to do. This is why the best people, the best leaders of corporations are the people who start out on ground floor. Because they've worked their way up and they know what the jobs that everybody does. You also know how you can cheat at the various jobs. So once you become CEO, you can watch out. These are the you, you can watch for how people are cheating. So if you want to know the processes of fabrication and other things in the mind, you have to consciously fabricate something good in the present moment, which is what concentration practice is. So we're taking this process of fabrication that, as I said, tends to look for trouble. We're actually trying to use it in a way that's giving a relatively comfortable place to stay in the mind. Once you've got that comfortable place, then you're also learning about the processes. And because the mind is still at that point, you can see what's going on. When the mind wants to go out for something, you can ask, them, why are you going? What are you looking for? You've got something good here. And the mind usually goes out looking for things outside because it has a sense of dis-ease in the present moment. If you can create a sense of ease, then you can tell yourself, I can be more, more picky about the food that I'm eating things that I'm looking for outside. So this is what we're doing as we focus on the present moment, not just simply accepting the moment, present moment as it is, but realizing it's something that we can change, it's something we can manipulate and make something good out of it. Now it's not just totally making things, because you have, if you're going to learn a skill, you also have to learn, observe, how skillful am I doing this? Am I getting the results I want or not? So it's a process both of acting and observing acting and observing, and getting closer and closer and closer to seeing, okay, what is it in the mind that keeps going out and looking for trouble? So this is what you're going to be doing as you get in the present moment. You're not just sitting here accepting things. Even when the Buddha is teaching things of such qualities as equanimity, uh, patience, contentment, those things are part of a proactive process. When Westerners went over to Asia, I don't know about other countries, but I know in Thailand at least, when the forest giants got these Westerners suddenly landing on their doorstep, they noticed that Westerners had problems with two things, i.e. patience and equanimity. Mm -hmm. You see all these stories that John Cha tells people about, hey, you're here in Thailand, it's hot, except the fact that <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. And he had, to, he had to emphasize it so much that you get a lot of the Westerners coming back and saying, well, that's all he taught, acceptance and equanimity. And that way, he was just basically getting them on the ground floor. Because this is in, traditionally in Thailand, I know Thailand now has been spoiled about like the rest of the world. But traditionally, you did not teach kids to be impatient. You taught them to be patient. You taught them to have equanimity about things. So they would not be disturbed by the, the, or defeated by the difficulties of life. But you didn't stop there. And the Buddha himself, when he was teaching Rahula how to meditate, he started out by saying, make your mind like earth. People are going to throw disgusting things on earth, earth doesn't react. People are going to pour perfume on earth, the earth doesn't react. Now that's ground floor. Then based on that, then he says, okay, now we're going to teach you breath meditation. And the way the Buddha taught breath meditation is very proactive. You breathe with the intent of, of creating certain mind states, breathe with the intent of creating certain kinds of feelings. 
You breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture. You breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. You breathe in a way that steadies the mind. You breathe in a way that gladdens the mind, releases the mind. So you're actively proactive in this. As you're doing this, you're learning a lot about fabrication. He says you, you, you become sensitive to bodily fabrication, which is the breath. You become sensitive to mental fabrication, which are feelings and perceptions. At the same time, you're calming them down. So equanimity, the equanimity of earth, he's not telling you to be a clod of dirt. He's saying, be observant. Make your mind really still and unaffected by things, because then you'll see clearly what's happening, what cause and effect are actually doing in your mind. If you get upset about, you know, your, the worst breath I ever had in my life, <laughs> then you're not going to be able to see the next breath. <laughs> you say, okay, this is not going well, but let's not get worried about it, let's just stick with it and, and work on it. You have to have that stability, that kind of even keel quality. So like when the Buddha is teaching equanimity, he doesn't teach just equanimity on its own. He basically says there's skillful equanimity and unskillful equanimity. And this, even with skillful equanimity, that's balanced. He always teaches it in the context of other factors. Like in the case of the Brahma Viharas, there's a universal goodwill, universal compassion, universal empathetic joy, and universal equanimity. Now you need all four of these qualities. You can't just go for the equanimity. He's basically teaching you the equanimity of a doctor. A doctor has goodwill, or the ideal doctor has goodwill for his or her patients. <laughs> and they're not thinking about what the drug companies are telling them to sell. Okay. You've got goodwill for your patient. You see the patient is suffering, you have compassion for the patient. And when the patient recovers, you're joyful for the patient. But you realize, okay, there's some patients I can't cure. And it's either because of their karma or my karma, but I can't cure them. So instead of getting upset about that fact, you say, well, what can I do to help them? Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe they need another doctor, or maybe there's no doctor can help them, but at least I can alleviate some of the pain. And so that's where you develop equanimity, because otherwise, if you focus on the things that you can't change, you're going to waste all the energy that you could have put into things that you could. So here, equanimity is not an ideal in and of itself. It's part of this process of wanting happiness for all beings. Wanting a harmless happiness for yourself, wanting a harmless happiness for others. Realizing, in this world, it's probably not going to happen. But at the very least, I want that to be the, my motivation. And when it's not happening, I don't want to get upset, because that's going to waste my energy. So equanimity is part of a whole set of qualities that you're trying to develop, and you need all the, all the qualities acting together. The same with patience. And the Buddha teaches being patient about painful words, being patient about hurtful things, painful feelings. But then there are other things he says you're not patient about. And this gets back, as with equanimity, it gets back to that distinction between your past karma, what's coming in for your past karma, and your present karma. The things that are coming in for your past karma, he says, you've a lot of patience with them. But what you're doing in the present moment, don't be patient with unskillful qualities. Now for past karma, things like, he's got some great passages on how to deal with hurtful words. Um, first, he says, basically, you depersonalize them. He, he, his, his analysis, he says, it's like, you realize you're in the human world, what, what is human speech like? There, there's truthful speech and there's untruthful speech. There's kind speech, there's unkind speech. There's speech that serves a purpose, there's speech that serves no purpose. So when people are saying lies and unkind things to you that serve no purpose, this is nothing new. And this is the way it is all over. You're not being subjected to something that's really out of the ordinary. So you learn how to take yourself out of that thing. Why are they saying this to me? Well, it's because they're human beings, okay? I'm a human being. My, my teacher had a student one time who was, she was quite good looking. She was a nurse, and all the other nurses liked to gossip about her. And she was getting sick and tired of being gossiped about. And one day she was sitting and meditating in the, the room where he was teaching. And she had this vision of herself being in this hall of mirrors, just images of herself going way, way, way back to the past. And she thought to herself, my gosh, I must have been the victim of this kind of gossip for a long time. And so, 
after she came out of meditation, she mentioned this to him, thinking that he would say something comforting. He said, well, you were the one who wanted to be born as a human being. <laughs> How can you blame that? So that's one where you depersonalize the unkind speech. Say, well, this is just human beings. If I wanted something better, I shouldn't have been born here. That's one thing. The other thing the Buddha says is, someone says something unkind, tell yourself, okay, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. <laughs> and leave it there. <laughs> now, how often have you done that? Just left it there. Because <laughs> we tend to embroider it. And the Buddha says, well, our minds are like gongs. You know, we hit the gong once and it just reverberates for a long time. That person says that one thing and it's just reverberating for days and weeks afterwards. So no wonder you're suffering. It's you are the one, you are the one who took it in. So if you can see it in that way, then you can learn how to be a lot more patient about hurtful words. But when it comes to things in your mind like thoughts of greed, anger, delusion, okay, don't be patient with these. You don't say, well, I'm, I just have to sit with this, I guess. No, you don't. You have, the, you have the choice to say, I can go with this thought or I don't want to go with this thought. Now you notice this when you're sitting and meditating with a the breath. There are noises of people moving around in the back or whatever. And you could say, I could sit here and focus on all the disturbances of the room, and I could, or I could say, what the hell, I'm going to stay with my breath. You've got that choice. So realize that you know, okay, something unskillful comes up in the mind. You say, I don't have to go with this. I can step back. So that's something you're not patient with. You're trying to figure out, why am I thinking this thought? Why, do, why would I want to feed on this kind of thought? Try to analyze it so you can get some understanding about it so it no longer has any power over you. And the same with content. You know, the Buddha teaches your people to be, particularly the monks, he teaches us to be content with whatever food, clothing, or shelter we get. He's got a teaching, though, on what he's called the customs of the noble ones, where there are four customs. And the first three we go again around contentment. You're content with whatever you get in terms of food, clothing, shelter. You also learn how to not pride yourself in the fact that I'm more content than other people are. <laughs> You've probably seen that, that Onion article they had about the, the, the monk who won the serenity contest. <laughs> <laughs> so you, okay, just because you're content doesn't mean that you're better than other people. You realize that you're content because it's good for you. In fact, this is the way it is with the whole path. We're doing this because it is good for us. It's like medicine. And other people are not taking their medicine. Well, you don't get upset. You don't pride yourself. You just say, look, I've got to do what I've got to do. But then when the Buddha gets to the fourth custom, it's not contentment. It's delighting in developing skillful qualities and delighting in abandoning unskillful ones. So you're content with things outside, you're content with what's coming in from your past karma, but you use that as a basis so you can focus on, well, what can I do now to make my mind more skillful? What can I do to get rid of the unskillful qualities I've got? So even, in, even with these, what are relatively passive, accepting kinds of activities, and these two are activities, they're a kind of karma. There's a belief somehow that it, if you're just non-reactive, you're not creating any karma. Non-reactivity is a kind of karma, and it's appropriate for some things, but not for everything. So even with these things, they're part of a proactive process of trying to get into shaping your mind right now in the present moment in a way so that you're not creating suffering for yourself right now, and you're also not creating suffering for other people. Now the thing is, though, that the Buddha said, even when you're creating the state of jhana, which is, which is how he defines right concentration, it's interesting with the word jhana, it's related to a verb jayati, which means to do jhana, to get the mind in absorption. But it also means to burn with a steady flame. You think of a, a you know, a, a, it's kind of like the steady flame of an oil lamp. Now, if you're sitting next to a, a wood fire, can you read by the wood fire that the flames are flickering? So they're all over the place. But if you have an oil lamp, you can read by the flame. So what you're trying to do is get the mind really, really still. It's like turning down the flames so that it's very steady. You can read the mind. It's not as flickering and as erratic as your mind was before, but it's still a flame. And your mind is still burning in the present moment because it's even with the state of jhana, you've got to continually maintain it. You've got to keep it going. You can't just say, well, I've done jhana and it's now an automatic pilot. I don't have to worry about it. You have to keep doing it. 
and you realize, okay, you're still you're still there in something that's burning. It's like a house that was burning, you know, erratically, but now you've got to kind of calm down. But it's still it's still a flame. And then the Buddha says, when you begin to realize that okay, even the state of jhana is created out of those aggregates, and they're still burning, that's when you look for something else. You say, is there something that is unfabricated, something that the mind is not creating at all? And if you know if the mind is sensitive enough, and your the mind is still enough. You hit the point where it opens up to something else. Now, this something else they call the deathless. That really is outside of time. There's no present, past, or future there. So we're not coming into the present to stay in the present. We're coming into the present because that's where the passage into something that is unfabricated can be found. And the Buddha, the Buddha describes it in ways that it kind of blows your mind. What it would be like to be outside of space and time? There's no location. He says, there's no coming, going, staying in place. There's no here, there, or between the two. This is something that's outside of space and time. But it can be accessed in the present moment when you've trained the mind to see how it's been fabricating things. You get to the point where, say, even the best fabrications are not good enough. There still is something that's kind of eating away at the mind, burning at the mind. I've got to find something and just find a way out. He says, it's through this that you find the way out. Now that may sound very far away, but it's good to know, know that okay, the Buddha is not telling you, okay, just satisfy yourself with the present moment. Because that would be like saying, okay, you're on fire, pretend that it's okay. He says, there's a way out. But he's saying, on the one hand, you can turn down the flames. You don't have to accept whatever's coming in the present moment, saying, well, this is just been, this is my karma. I've got to accept the present moment. It's the only reality there is. You have this ability to bring new ways of thinking, new ways of perceiving to what's ex what you're experiencing. And this begins with you know, very basic practices, learning to be more generous, learning to be more virtuous. Instead of thinking about, well, what can I get out of this moment? You ask, well, what can I give? And that put, gives you in a, puts you in a different relationship. You suddenly be, put yourself in a position of wealth. I've got something to share. The same with virtue. You're saying, okay, there are limits on the things I'm going to do in order to find happiness, because I don't want to harm anybody. So you look for ways of finding happiness that don't harm anybody, and you find that they're there. In other words, what you're looking for is going to determine what you're going to find. One of the monks at the monastery admitted to me one time, he liked going down to the airport every now and then. We got somebody flying in, flying out that we have to go pick up. He said he'd like going down to the airport because he could see all the pretty women. I said, what kind of monk is this? <laughs> but then he said he realized what he was doing, so one day he said, okay, now I'm going to go down to the airport, I'm going to look for the signs of aging. And he discovered they were everywhere. He hadn't seen them because he wasn't looking for them. So you change what you're looking for, and this is going to determine what you see. That's one lesson that the Buddha gives you, that even if you're not going all the way to awakening, at the very least, remind yourself, you have the power to change the present moment, if you do it skillfully. When I mean, you have the power to change it anyhow, the question is, how are you going to use it? So he's saying, look at, try to find out, what am I bringing to this that's making me suffer? What's creating suffering? We'll turn around and look for the cause there. That's one message. And then the second message, of course, is the Buddha is bringing you to the present moment, not because he, he's going to leave you there. He says, you're in the... You know, the past is burning, the future is burning, the present moment is burning. But the present moment has that passage that goes to something that goes outside of time, which is where true happiness is found. And so you turn down the flames and you find it. And he said, when you get out there, okay, that's a freedom that's inflammable. It's never going to set on fire. It's always going to be there for you. So this is why the present moment is not something just to be accepted, and it's also not the goal. It's something that you can look at how you're creating, so you can turn it into a path. At the very least, it alleviates your suffering. At the best, you can turn it into a path that leads you to the end of suffering, which, it, which really is outside of past, present, and future. So, those are my thoughts for tonight. I was wondering if you had any questions. Yes? In your opinion, do you think it's possible for a lay person to get that place? My teacher had a couple of lay students I thought had done. 
whom you have to be determined. They were the kind of people who meditated every day, practiced every day. And in, in, in the time of the Buddha, there were a lot of lay people who you, you found that dimension. So it is possible. Yes? So um, when you were saying something about uh, suffering and how we burn it off, is that like we, we burn off like the hunger for food, the hunger for suffering? You're not going to be burning off the suffering. That, that, that was the, the other group that was trying to burn off their suffering. In this case, you're looking for, well, how am I feeding? Can I feed in a new way? And ultimately, when you get to that point, the, the mind does not need to feed anymore. I mean, the body will need to feed as long as you're alive. But with full awakening, the mind doesn't need to feed on, on things outside. It's basically found something that doesn't need to be maintained, doesn't need to be nourished. Yes? I had a thought during the meditation, if there's no difference between self and other, or mind and, and, and the universe, then what, what, is, what is it that creates during the focus? Who told you there's no difference between self and other? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a thought that I had during yeah. the meditation. Okay, well there's... I can't breathe for you. I mean, there's some things we have in common and some things we don't. Your experience of your body from within, your experience of your mind from within, that's totally yours. And so within that experience, so that you're doing the breathing. Now, of course, the way you're breathing is going to be influenced by your environment around you. So there's kind of, an in, there's kind of a back and forth there. But there's, there's one part of you that nothing else can touch. You know, I can't get in, like, you probably, when you were a little kid, you probably asked your friends, you know, does your blue look the same as my blue? And basically that, that part of you, that how you experience the world directly, that's something that you can't share with anybody. And that's the area where suffering is happening, and also that's its qualities that you're within that area that you're going to use in order to put an end to suffering. When the Buddha is teaching not self, he's basically he's not. He wasn't saying there is no self or there is no separate self. He was saying that we're holding on to things that are making us suffer because we like them, and so he says we've got to see the downside. And so looking for the downside is simply these things are not under your control. There are a lot of things that are not under your control. And when you begin to see that, that's when you begin to let go. So when he's teaching not self, it's part of a strategy teaching you how to let go of things. As for the question of whether there is or is not a self, he didn't even answer it. Yes? Uh, thank you for being here again. Um, throughout my life I've been noticing that people, and myself personally, always follow the same pattern. Um, Make mistakes mm -hmm. in relationships, from, from myself to business. But I notice that the problem in business comes from relationships and communication. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my one of my favorite talks that you have is the one um, about unlearning unskill, unskillful behavior. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not fitting in my mind because I can recognize what I'm doing wrong. Mm -hmm. and we can recognize what we're doing wrong, especially in relationships. But we follow the same pattern. What would be your best advice? Use your imagination. <laughs> I mean, the reason we don't, the reason we follow the same pattern is one, it's all we know. Or two, we may have heard of some other pattern, but we don't believe we can follow it. And so, what you need is some alternative examples. Of, you know how something is done. So you can see, oh, that person did that really skillfully. I want to remember that. And then secondly, believe me, I can do that. And, and both of those take an act of imagination to get yourself out of the old pattern. I'm trying to think of some good examples. Okay, well, I can think of one. Um, when I was a young monk, we had this old monk who was staying at the monastery. 
And he was one of those old monks who basically ordained after he retired and was basically going to live out his life comfortably, not having to do much. And he liked to talk about how he was beyond any sensual desire, especially sexual desire at all. And yet he was always the one who was making analogies, talking about, well, you know, some things in the, in the early evening you want the prettiest girl, but in the, as the evening goes on you're willing to take whatever, you know. And, you know, I got sick and tired of hearing this. And so one day he was talking about how he was totally devoid of sexual desire, and I said, look, you're the only one around here talking about it. <laughs> I don't believe this. <laughs> well, there was a big blow-up. And word got to a John Fu, and he said, um, you know, there's this more skillful way of doing that. <laughs> Which is, okay, you may be free of sexual desire, but the rest of us are not. It really has a big impact on us when you talk about these things. And the years later, after John Fung died and I was in charge of the monastery, there was this one young monk who was ordained for the rains, and his mother would come every day and she would bring a newspaper. Now the Thai newspaper, section two, first page, section two, always has a scantily clad woman. That's, that's how they sell the newspapers. And it, I, I don't know why it was, but that always seemed to be the page that was left open around, you know. The time. <laughs> and so I called the monks together. I said, look, this may not be having an impact on you, but it's having an impact on me. Could you stop this? That was the end of it. So it's good to have a good example that you can apply. So look around for some good examples. Yes. Mm -hmm. You spoke about um, changing our present moment with perception or otherwise. How do we distinguish, or how can we you know, skillfully do that and not cling or get in a trap of reversion? Well, it's, um, it's a matter of using, thinking, okay, the way I perceive things is a strategy. And as with all strategies, before you get to the end of the path, you're going to have to hold on to it. So in other words, you know, the Buddha talks about four kinds of clinging. He says you're clinging to sensuality, which is not so much clinging to sensual pleasures as it is clinging to your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. Like how you'd like to decorate your house. You can you know, move the things around, or how, what kind of clothing you'd like to wear. These kinds of things. You can, you can fantasize about that for hours. Right? And, and he's, he's basically, we're more stuck in the fantasies than we are in the reality. That's one kind of clinging. Second kind of clinging, clinging to habits and practices. I've always done things this way, I've always got to do it this way. Or believing that if I do things in a certain ritualistic way, little, little rituals that we have, it's, I'm going to be happy. I've got a story about this, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and then clinging to views, in other words, this is the way the world is, and I'm not going to listen to any other way that people describe the world. Back in the time of the Buddha, they, would, they got into big arguments. Is the world eternal? Is the world not eternal? I mean, we have that argument now. Was it created by God? Was it not created by God? And people are going back and forth and really getting worked up about it, holding on to this is the way it's got to be. And then finally clinging to your ideas of who you are. So those are the four kinds of clinging. Uh, my favorite story about habits and practices. There was an Australian, Austrian, excuse me, Austrian biologist who was raising geese, and he had this one mother goose, and she gave birth to a gosling, and then she died. And so the gosling immediately imprinted on the biologist, and took him as took him as the, the goose's mother to follow him around all through the summer. When fall came, he was becoming more and more of a goose now. The biologist realized, okay, I can't keep the goose outside. We've got to bring the goose inside because it's going to get cold. And so one evening, instead of feeding the goose at its normal time, he just walked into the house and left the door open. So the goose walks into the house and immediately freaks out. It's never been inside before. Well, it sees this window at the end of the hall. And so it goes running for the window, realizes it can't get out. And so in the meantime, the, the biologist has gone up the stairway to the right which went up to his apartment on the, on the next floor. And she calls to the goose. So the goose turns around, goes up the stairs, gets fed. And then from that point on, every time the goose went into the house, it would go to the window, go back, up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and as time wore on, the trip to the window got shorter and shorter, until finally he would go to that corner of the stairway, shake his foot, head up the stairs. <laughs> 
And then one night, the biologist came home really late, and the goose was really hungry. And so the biologist opens the door, and the goose goes running up the stairs. He stops halfway up the stairs, starts shaking all over, and then goes down, walks to the window, comes back, goes up. <laughs> So that's clinging to habits and practices. <laughs> You're listening to your inner goose. Now, when the Buddha is teaching the path, he has a perp he has a use for three of those four kinds of clinging. Sensuality clinging, he says, this is not going to help you on the path. However, you do have to cling to certain practices. You cling to the practice of precepts. You cling to the practice of meditation. You cling to certain views about what, what causes suffering and how to put an end to it, and also cling to views about karma. And then finally, cling to the, the idea of yourself, and you are someone who's capable of doing this. Now you hold on to these things. You think of the image of the raft. The Buddha says you cross the river, and everybody likes to think about the point where you get to the other side, you can let go of the raft. But while you're crossing across the river, you've got to hold on. So when you're thinking about perceptions that you're going to use, what perception can I use to look at this so I'm not getting worked up about it, so I can actually be more calm and peaceful and see what needs to be done? Hold on to that perception. <coughs> now you find there's certain other perceptions you had that you really liked, but are actually causing you trouble. Well, you, the Buddha says, really look at that trouble, one. But then also go back and look at, why do I still like this? Because you can look at the drawbacks of something, and as long as you don't understand, well, why do I really go for it, you're not going to let go. And sometimes we have attachments that we're not all that proud about, and things that we really like that we don't particularly like about ourselves, but we're going to hold on, so we just hide them from ourselves. So one of the purposes of the meditation is to learn to see, ask yourself, why do I like this? And then you compare, oh, this is why I like it, and this is why I, this, these are the drawbacks. And that's going to be a lot easier to let go. Yes? You were just talking about clinging um, as a raft to mm -hmm. the other side. So would you then stop before the becoming when it gets active, or would you cling all the way to sort of becoming this more whatever the clinging of the boat was to? It kind of seems like that becoming, then kind of the ship has sailed into the whole birth aging death. Yeah, well, you're going to, you're going to take on the identity of someone who's practicing. Then you let go of that at the very end. So you kind of let go of the clinging, like a smidgey before yeah. becoming. I mean, there's certain things that you will kind of peel off along the way. But there will still be that, that sense of identity. There's, there's me here doing the practice. And this is why when the Buddha says, with your first taste of awakening, your identity with the aggregates goes away, but there's still a sense of identity. Because basically at that point you've completed your, your development of virtue, but you've got to complete your development of concentration, you've got to complete your development of discernment. And there needs a sense of, I've got to do this. There's got to be an I hovering around there. But this is, this is something the forest that John's talking a lot about. They said, you don't just let go from the very beginning. As, as John Lee says, it's like someone who doesn't have any money, so I'm just going to give, you know, give up all my money. <laughs> and you're poor, you know, there's nothing there. Whereas if you work to develop your wealth, then you say, I, you know, I'm not going to be carrying it around with me all the time, but it's there. You think about the Buddha, you know, he continued to practice concentration, he continued to develop using, using discernment on how he's going to teach people. It was there for him to use, he just wasn't clinging to it at that point. And John Cha has a great story about this. He says it's like coming back from a, from a, from a market and you've got a banana. And someone comes up and says, you know, what are you going to do with the banana? I'm going to eat it. How about the peel? Are you going to eat that too? No. Then why are you carrying the peel? <laughs> and then he says, well, how are you going to answer him? Or with what are you going to answer him? And his first, he's got a two-stage answer. This first stage, I said, Okay, you're going to answer out of desire. I mean, you're going to have to want to come up with a good answer. He's pointing to the fact that to practice, you need desire. To develop discernment, you need desire. And then, of course, the other answer is the time hasn't come to let it go yet. You know, if I threw away the peel now, the banana would become mush in my hands. So you wait until the time to eat, then you take the peel off, then you eat it. In the same way, if you're 
You know, if you let go of the path before it's done, your mind becomes mush. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, there's certain things you've got to hold on to in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Yes? What um, like idea or branch of Buddhism is this? I'm new, so I Okay. The, this is called Theravada okay. and Thai forest tradition okay. and the lineage of a John Lee, kind of parsing it down. Okay. Yes? What is forest tradition, uh, sort of what makes it different from other traditions, and what is a Thai forest tradition, is there something that makes it different from other forest, forest traditions? traditions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called a forest tradition because the monks originally went out into the forest to practice. And this was back in a time when the government was actually trying to get the monks to stop going into the forest. And, and they, wanted, they were, this is back when the time of Rama V, beginning, beginning of the 20th century. And he realized, okay, if Thailand was going to survive as a country, they needed to have an educational system, which they didn't have at the time. And so how do you develop, build an educational system out of no money? Well, you go to the monasteries in the villages and you say, can you give us a little bit of your land so we can build a school? So they didn't have to buy land, they got free land. And then they told the monks, will you teach the kids? <laughs> in the meantime, they started teacher training schools, but it was going to take a while before, before it got the regular teachers. So they actually had the monks coming in and teaching school. There was actually a government law that monks had to teach elementary school. Now the monks who wanted to practice say, we got to get out of here. <laughs> and so, and, and, and you know, the Buddha, of course, encourages monks to go in the forest, so they said, let's go in the forest. <laughs> and the irony of all this was that you know, after, after the monasteries had given the land and the monks had given their lives to pay teachers, then the monks got pushed out as lay teachers came in. To, to take, you know, they were trained now as elementary school teachers and high school teachers. You had all these monks now who had no purpose in life. And then it was the forest monks who came in and said, okay, look, this is the way the Buddha taught us to practice. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that way, and what's different between this and other forest traditions in other parts of Burma and... There's a huge emphasis on the Tudanga practices, you know, the, the ascetic practices. Um, there's no particular meditation technique that's associated with the practice, with the things. I mean, they, there are many, many techniques that the forest monks used. I was trained in that when I said the Ajahn Lee lineage, that was because Ajahn Lee taught breath meditation as his main topic. But other teachers would teach contemplation of the body, um, contemplation of the elements, those kind of things. Yes? It's so kind of a Thanks again for coming back again. I'm kind of piggybacking on that question a few times ago in regards to like uh, appropriate time to let go of the path and, mm -hmm. and the banana metaphor. Um, so my question is, uh, as you were saying, you know, giving up the path to where you make supreme much. So is it like an insight you would develop later on in the path and be like, oh, now it's now it's totally the time to let this go? Mm -hmm. Like, would it be something very apparent and obvious? Like, if you got home and you're like. No, it's going to be a lot of mm. Well, it's, it's basically when you, your mind gets more and more sensitive, you begin to see more and more subtle ways that you're creating suffering. So whenever you see it that oh, I'm creating suffering through this, then you let it go. And then it's only when you say, the only thing that's left is I'm holding on to the path. Everything else I've let go of. Okay, you let go of that. As long as you have other things you got to let go of, hold on to the path and let go of the other things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? You said that the two most difficult things that Westerners had um, to deal with when they went over to Thailand to practice with the monks were acceptance and equanimity. Pa patience and equanimity, yeah. Patience and equanimity. Mm -hmm. So, um, my two questions. So, what do, you, what, what do you mean by equanimity? And then, secondly, why do you think? Westerners had the most difficult with those. Well, one, I mean, equanimity is basically keeping the mind emotionally on an even keel. So uh, things you can't change, you don't get upset about them. 
And we're taught that hey, you can change anything. And patience, of course, I mean, the media have been spending all the past time, how many years now? Decades teaching us to be impatient. Right? You have three seconds, it's not enough. It's too much. Excuse me, three seconds. I have to wait for three seconds for something. I push a button on my computer. I have to wait for three seconds. This is un it's intolerable. <laughs> you saw that Saturday Night Live sketch, didn't you, about the, the tech talk? You know that one? Yeah. Yeah. Where they have these guys complaining about the new iPhone. You know, it's it's you know it's it takes it takes five seconds for the Google Maps to upload. It. And then they bring in some workers from the factory in China that made the things. Say, okay, you know, talk to the workers about what's the problem here. Oh yes, I understand you have long waits. Yes, I had long wait too. I have to wait 17 hours to get formula for my baby. You know? <laughs> Go look it up. Google, Google it. It's you know, Saturday Night Live. Chinese, Chinese iPhone workers. You know. <laughs> it's one of the best sketches they ever, sketches they ever did. But yeah, that's our problem. Our culture has taught us to be impatient. Mommy, I want this right now. TV told me I want this right now. That's that's what we've been trained by. Yes. About the uh, not teaching uh, no self mm -hmm. or not self. Well, he taught not self and uh, not no self. Harvey? He taught not self. Uh, not self. But not no self. Yeah. <laughs> And the, well, is it, isn't what the historical Buddha taught, maybe I should just ask you what you mean by uh, not self? Not self is the perception, okay, this thing is not myself, or this activity is not myself, or I cannot, I cannot identify myself around this. Whereas no self is the metaphysical thing, there is no self. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that was... So, so does that really equate to then to say this is myself and identifying with it, so to speak? It's, it's a fabrication function. It's a fabrication. And as you're practicing, you'll find, I mean, we're already having perceptions of self and not self all the time. It's just we tend to be kind of random about how we do it. You know, you identify with a particular thought, another thought comes in your mind, you don't identify with it. Or you can change things very quickly. I'll give you an example. Suppose you have a little sister, and the kids down the street are beating her up. And if she's your sister at that point, you've got to go down and defend her, right? Bring her home. She comes home, she starts playing with your truck, your little toy truck. All of a sudden, she's not your sister anymore, she's the other. <laughs> and so our line about how we define self and not self keeps changing. It's kind of like an ame amoeba. And so the Buddha said, okay, learn how to do this skillfully. And in the beginning, he talks about having a skillful sense of self, a sense of self that is responsible. He basically, when he's, it's, it's kind of a function that you, um, it's a fabrication. And it, you do it in two ways. One, you, your sense of who you are in terms of who's going to be enjoying the happiness that you're looking for. This is going to be my happiness. I will enjoy this. And then there's you as the producer. I can, I can bring it about. And he says, use those. For example, with the, with the self as the producer, he says, create the sense, okay, other people can do this, they're human beings. I'm a human being, I can do it too. He actually encourages you to develop this attitude. Okay, that's self as producer. Self as consumer is, I started this practice because I love myself and I didn't want to suffer. If I give up, do I really love myself? No. So keep on with the practice. So that's the self as a consumer. Now you use those perceptions when they're useful. And then when you don't need them anymore, they're like the raft, you put them aside. All creative in a part of a positive way. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's sort of where I was coming from as well, and it spoke to your earlier comment. So, so the, uh, the consciousness of the scot, the skanda or aggregate of consciousness, mm -hmm. is the watcher of the breath. Mm -hmm. Is that also self? That you will identify it as yourself for a while, but you have to let go of it at some point too. I mean, it, this is why, as a, as a meditator, you want to develop that per, that perception of the observer that can watch anything, be like Earth and not get upset. 
identify with that for the time being. Now you peel away other more unskillful ways of identifying. Yes? During your talk, I think you used the term aggregate. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what those are, are and are there sort of common aggregates that exist <laughs> in, in us? Okay, well the Buddha defined five aggregates. Now the, the reason they, ch they used, chose that word, you know, this is back, they started translating Buddhist text back in the 18th century. And this is the word they chose. And back in those days they said, you know, you have, there are two kinds of groups of things in the world. There are systems and there are aggregates. Systems are where things kind of work together. And aggregates are just kind of random stuff. And so, and so they chose this way. You know, you, you, your, your sense of who you are is basically created out of all this random stuff. And there are five kinds. There's the form, there's a the body. <coughs> Feelings, you know, pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Perceptions, which are the labels you put on things. Fabrications, and then consciousness. So those are the five aggregates. And each of us has clusters of these. And we can, we can identify with any of these things, or we can identify ourselves as, I'm the owner of these aggregates, or I'm in these aggregates, or the aggregates are in me. And you can define yourself in any way around those. Like say, I'm, I, I'm not my body, but I'm the owner of this body. That's, that's a way of defining yourself around the aggregate of form. I mean, the big one, of course, is we identify with our consciousness. But this doesn't mean that when you gain awakening, you're totally unconscious. Now, our consciousness is consciousness that has objects. Consciousness of awakening has no objects. So it's not a blank out. Okay. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask what are the like, <coughs> main differences between books and Theravada mm -hmm. and then the other one, Mahayana? Mahayana. 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 Yeah. Vajrayana. Vajrayana, the Tibetans? Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, <laughs> the Theravada is basically, okay, there was a Buddha who taught us how to find an, an end to suffering, and we can follow his teachings, put an end to suffering. But we have to do the work ourselves. He points out the way we do the work ourselves. In the Mahayana, you can't do the work all on yourself. There has to be a, a, a bodhisattva who's going to come and help you. But then you become a bodhisattva, so you can help others, kind of pass it on. Vajrayana, they say they have the shortcut. They've got some magical formulas. You can force those body, bodhisattvas to come and do, you know, inspire you. In very short terms, that's that's the difference. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm doing a school project on like exploring different. Hmm. Hmm. Cultures from my own steps. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So I know a lot of uh, our Buddhism is very much um, on a thing that it's giving, right? Like the statue binding on the Buddha, mm -hmm. four years of Buddha, mm -hmm. and so on, <coughs> um, the bowl of rice or the food that was offered to him. Mm -hmm. um, so I know it's heavily dependent on the community to donate food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Necessities to the monks. Um, did the Buddha give any guidance? Um, let's say the old son, there was no community mm -hmm. to support the monks. Mm -hmm. What guidance did he give to continue the religion? Because obviously monks can't work, they can't. If it got that bad, he said, well, we'll just put up with the fact that you can't survive anymore. I mean, he, he knew that, that the religion was going to die out someday. But he didn't encourage us, well, you know, break the rules so you can continue it. He didn't encourage that at all. So when the monks go into a forest, or like Thai forest tradition, mm -hmm. do they make it a point to stay somewhat close to a, a village? Well, you have to stay close enough so you can go for homes. <laughs> Unless you decide, I want, to, I want to fast for a couple of weeks, maybe I just want to get further away. But the wilderness in Thailand is not like wilderness here. I mean, here, here you can go for miles and miles and miles and there's nobody. And in Thailand, even 
out in the forest, there are little houses here and there. And it's, you know, it's usually within a day's walking distance. Yes? What did Buddha say about how an inexperienced student, or just, you know, a student who ascertain the fitness of any given teaching or any given teacher? Okay, for the teacher, he said you got to hang around the teacher for a while and watch, observe the person. And the just a couple of questions you ask is, does this teacher have the kind of greed, aversion, or delusion that would cause him or her to claim knowledge that he or she didn't have? One. And two, would this person ever get anyone to do something that was not in their best interest? And so you have to observe for a while. You can't say, say well, this, you know, this retreat brochure, the teacher is smiling, must be a good teacher. <laughs> You have to you have to be hang around the person to get to know them, to get to know them. And as for the teaching, he says you you test a teaching by if I put this teaching into practice, what results would I get? Would I find that I'm putting you know causing less and less suffering for myself and less and less suffering for others? Because then it's a good teaching. There's a an article I wrote called Lost in Quotation, which talks about the, the Buddha talking about how you, how you judge a teaching, because you, you've probably seen it. They, you know, they said, don't believe anything, the Buddha. <coughs> well, there, there was a sutta where he's, he starts out saying something that sounds like that, but then there's a big passage where he also has said, also, also take into consideration the fact that take what the wise people say, the people around you who seem wise, listen to them. And you can't do things just because someone says so, but also even because something seems reasonable and may not be true, you've got to actually put it to the test. There's that. And then there's an article I wrote called Honest to Goodness, in on Dhamma Talks, which is about the qualities that you have to bring to the practice and the qualities you want to look for in a teacher. Yes? Um, starting with the uh, good will meditation, I uh, a lot of us that have come up learning from like a lay teacher have uh, learned practicing meta by like repeating phrases. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say some colorful things that you just don't like practicing that way. That it, how do you like to practice meta? Well, it's well, you basically you think about who is there out there who for whom I have ill will. <laughs> You can probably think of several people. It's like, what's, what do I gain from this ill will? And you say, well, you know, they've, they've been bad enough for a long time. Let them suffer a little bit before they're happy. <laughs> so, but you know, when people suffer, it's not the case that they all come to their senses. Some people suffer and they get worse. You say, okay, wouldn't it be nice if everybody could find true happiness inside. In other words, understand the causes of happiness and be willing and able to act on them. And if you can work your way into thinking that even this person that I really, really dislike, he's been horrible to people and whatever, but I, and I can still wish for this person to change his ways and be, and be a happy person. Because you're doing this for yourself. In other words, if I had to have dealings with that person, and if I did not have goodwill for that person, I can't trust myself to act in a skillful way. So it, it, instead of just saying, okay, you know, cotton candy for everybody, you say, <laughs> you basically say, is there anybody out there for whom I have ill will? I've got to think my way out of that. And as you start doing it with some people, then you find it easier and easier to do with other people. And then you can think, okay, goodwill for everybody, and it comes naturally. <coughs> got to change the perception. Hmm. I'm a little better at that. Okay, well, thank you for your interest and your attention. Hope this has been helpful. <laughs>